All right. Second Kings 22. Get to that stuff in, in a moment. Part of the chapter that I want to focus on, this seems kind of an unorthodox verse to go with the topic. It's in verse number 20. It says, Behold, therefore I will gather thee unto thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered into thy grave in peace. And thine eyes shall not see the evil which I bring upon this place. And they brought the king word again. The title of my sermon is Zionism, the red carpet of the Antichrist. The red carpet of the Antichrist. Here in this chapter, God tells Josiah that he's going to pour out his wrath on the children of Judah. He says that he's going to punish them for going into idolatry and forsaking the commandments and the covenant of the Lord. And he says that because Josiah has tried to get the nation back to God, he said he was going to die in peace. And he said he was not going to see this destruction that happened. Look at 2 Kings 23, verse number 3. It says, And the king stood by a pillar, talking about Josiah, and he made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments after his testimonies and his statutes with all their heart and with all their soul to perform all the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people stood to the covenant. So he makes a commitment to do what is right, regardless that he knew that God was going to destroy the nation. God said, I'm going to destroy it. I'm going to destroy it in your lifetime. And Josiah is like, you know what? He didn't say nuts to it. Oh, well, uh, God's going to destroy it anyway. No, he tried to steer the whole nation back to God. So regardless, if things are inevitable, it doesn't mean that we should just accept them like we can't do anything about them and make them better. Yes, God's wrath was to be poured out on the people of, of Judah through Babylon, but Josiah did the right thing in trying to get them back to God. My wife, she did uh, for years and years, she did Weight Watchers, right? And the lady that, uh, that uh, was the host of Weight Watchers, she was talking about like blowing your diet. And I don't know if you guys have, have done it. I've done the, the same thing. We'll say that they have a candy dish at work, right? So you're walking by somebody's desk and they have a candy dish and they have like a Reese cup, okay? And they have a Reese cup and you're like, oh man, you know? And you and you just you're tempted to eat this Reese cup and you're like, man, I should. I'm, I'm, this is not on my diet plan, right? So you grab this Reese cup and you eat it and you're like, oh, I've just blown my diet. So you're like, that's it. I, just whatever. I'm gonna go and eat a whole chocolate cake, you know? I'm just going. <laughs> I'm just going to the buffet, you know? The lady said, you know, she, she said, you know what? If you drop your cell phone, you're not going to pick the thing up and just keep slamming it on the ground and jumping up and down on the thing, you know? She said, if you make a mistake, don't, you know, that's not a reason to just to totally go off the rails is what she was talking about. You know, the Bible says that evil men and seducers shall wax worse. This world is getting worse. Yeah. This world is heading to a direction of a one world government. This world is heading to its end, okay? But that doesn't mean we throw in the towel, right? right? The events of Revelation are going to happen, but does that mean that we as a church ought to be like, you know what? The world's going to a one world religion. Why don't I just support it? You know, why don't we just, why don't we just all hold hands and sing Kumbaya? Why don't we get, a hold of, uh, get along with the Pentecostals and the Catholics, right? Because we're going to a one world government anyway. It's inevitable. It's going to happen. That's not a conspiracy theory. I can show you the verse that that's going to happen. But uh, are we just going to accept ecumenicalism? Huh? Are we just going to uh, hold hands with everybody and get along with everybody? No, we fight against these things, okay? Amen. We fight against these things. We don't throw in the towel. You know, we shouldn't say, uh, uh, let's just uh, all hold hands and all get along in these things. We shouldn't support a one world government either. But yet today, today, 2018, Christians support Zionism, and I'm going to show you that Zionism is the red carpet that the Antichrist walks into power on. Amen. They roll out the red carpet, and he walks on that, and he marches right into power. Right. What is Zionism to start with? Zionism, what is that? Zionism, this is according to Wikipedia, it said it's the national movement of the Jewish people that supports the reestablishment of the Jewish homeland in the territory defined as the historic land of Israel, roughly corresponding to Canaan, the Holy Land, and the region of Palestine. Modern Zionism emerged in the late 19th century in Central and Eastern Europe as a national revival movement in both reaction to a newer waves of anti-Semitism and as an imitative response to other exclusionary nationalist movements. Soon after this, most leaders of the movement associated the main goal with creating the desired state in Palestine, then an area controlled by the Ottoman Empire. Until 1948, the primary goal of Zionism were the reestablishment of the Jewish sovereignty in the land of Israel, in gathering of the exiles, and liberation of the Jews from an anti-Semitic discrimination and persecution that they experienced during their diaspora. 
Since the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948, Zionism continues primarily to advocate on behalf of Israel and to address threats to its continued existence and security. So what Zionism is, just in just very basic terms, is to say that these people that are saying that they are Jews, that they, they want this piece of land that was occupied uh, by the Ottoman Empire in Palestine, known as Palestine, that that's theirs by right and that that's and that's their land. They want their sovereignty. Because they were scattered, they were spread out through uh, Eastern Europe and many other places and they were getting a lot of discrimination. They are getting a lot of discriminations for a lot of their uh, uh, a lot of their behaviors, not just because that they're Jewish. It wasn't their ethnicity. But having said that, 1948, the nation of Israel became a nation, and people celebrate that all the time. What was it, the 70th year, I think it was, recently that they had the anniversary of that. But this happened in 1948, that Israel became a nation, and you know what? It was not made a nation by God. It was made a nation, why what? A vote by the United Nations. You think about that, United Nations, a one world governing body is the one that made Israel a state. And then you have religious Zionism. What is religious Zionism? I want you to just listen to these, these things that I'm reading, okay? The main ideologue of modern religious Zionism was Rabbi Abraham Isaac Cook. It's pronounced K-O-O-K. -K. I guess it's, it could be Kook. I think the guy is a Kook. Amen. But he was justified Zionism according to Jewish law and urged religious Jews to support efforts to settle the land and the secular labor Zionist to give more consideration to Judaism. So he, he's, he's trying to uh, kind of work both sides of the aisle. The people that are, are there, they want the government and the sovereignty and stuff like that. He's trying to say, hey, there's a spiritual application. And the people that are having a spiritual application, he's trying to tell them, hey, you want your sovereignty and the government and things like that. So he's trying to work both sides of the aisle to get this uh, 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 Zionist state going. So Cook saw Zionism now listen to this. I want you to listen. Cook saw Zionism as a part of a divine scheme, a divine scheme, which would result in the resettlement of the Jewish people in its homeland. This would bring salvation to Jews and then the entire world. This is what they believe. This is what religious Zionism believes. That their resettlement was just that step one. That's the starting line for salvation to come to the Jews, right? And then to the whole world. He says, after world harmony is achieved by the refoundation of the Jewish homeland, the Messiah would come. That's what he's saying. Although this has not yet happened, Cook emphasized that this would take time and that the ultimate redemption happens in stages, often not apparent while happening. It kind of sounds like dispensationalist, doesn't it? You know, can't explain something, so they're like, oh, everything's all mystical and, and, and uh, relative. In 1924, when Cook became the Ashkenazi chief rabbi of Palestine, whatever title that is, he tried to reconcile Zionism with Orthodox Judaism. So, go to Romans chapter 9. Aren't the Jews God's chosen people? Pastor Fritz, why are you having this discussion, huh? Why are you talking about this? Uh, they're God's chosen people. We should be supportive of them and no matter what endeavor that they do. We need to be supportive of them. And, and, and maybe, maybe that is the start. Maybe we should celebrate them going back to this, this uh, uh, piece of land over in the Middle East. Maybe we should be supportive of that. The Jews are God's chosen people, right? I've heard this all my life. How many of you all have heard that? That the Jews are God's chosen people. What I mean, you know, uh, how are you proving a Jew? We're talking about William Shatner, David Lee Roth. Everybody know who these people are? Okay, I'm maybe showing my age. Like David Lee Roth. Uh, 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 yeah, Adam Sandler. I mean, all sorts of different people. The, these famous actors and stars and things like that uh, uh, that are saying that they're Jewish, you know? Are they Jewish? I don't know, probably no more than I am, just to be honest with you. Many of them are Ashkenazi Jews. Many of them have uh, uh, European descent. But having said that, they say that the Jews, and that's just, uh, if you have a Jewish last name, you, you, I guess you fit in 2018, <laughs> that you're somehow special to God. I mean, just absent, uh, you're, you're more special than I am, which is just weird on the surface if you think about it. Right. But other Jews over in Israel right now, God's chosen people, and he's just taking a break from them, but he's fixing to reestablish his covenant sometime in the near future. We have no idea when. And then whenever he reestablishes his uh, covenant with them, you know, they're going to do the sacrifices and all of these things, and, and, and then, you know, uh, salvation is going to be by works and all of this other stuff. But right now he's just kind of taking a break from them. Romans 9, verse number 3. Romans 9, verse number 3. It says, For I... 
could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of law and the service of God and the promises, who are the fathers, and of whom, as look what it says, concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all, God is blessed forever. Amen. Not as, this is verse number 6, Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Amen. Neither, look at what it says, Neither, verse number 7, Because they are the seed of Abraham, are they all children? But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Verse number 8, That is, they which are the children of the flesh. Do you see that? These are not, underline that word in your Bible, the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Could it not be clearer? It's not of the flesh. It is to the seed, the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll get to that in a minute. Go to Romans 11. But, I mean, clearly, the, the children of the flesh are not the children of, of God, okay? Yeah. Romans 11, verse number 7. What then? It says, Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, Look, but the election hath obtained it. Do you see? And the rest were blinded. Do you see the contrast there? If I said, Clark Kent hasn't obtained, but Superman has, what would you think to yourself? That Clark Kent and Superman are two different people, right? The election in Israel are being contrasted here, okay? So to sit there and say that Israel is the elect is foolish because they are being contrasted. It says, Israel has not obtained, but the election has obtained. They're not the same people, folks. Go to Galatians chapter number 3. Galatians chapter number 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse number 6 says, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. For, so, for somebody to say, hey, these people are Jewish. Why are they Jewish? Because they're the children of Abraham. We're the children of Abraham. No, they which are of faith are the same as the children of Abraham. Okay? I am of faith. You are of faith if you're saved. If you put all your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and you're saved, you are the children of Abraham. Amen. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through what faith? He preached before the gospel unto Abraham. Andrew Sluter, put that in your pipe and smoke yeah. it. Amen. Saying in these shall all, all nations be blessed, right? If it's just the Jews, just the nation of Israel, okay? I don't have my map up here. My, my, I used to have that map up here. I'd act like a weatherman. It was kind of cool. If the Jews... We're the only nation that's God's chosen people, and they're all special. Why would all nations be blessed right. by, by Abraham? They're all blessed because there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon Him. Right. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Okay, that's, that's why everybody's going to be blessed. Because there's no difference. Because the gospel uh, transverses any kind of ethnicity, language, anything. Okay, the gospel it blesses everybody. Everybody can be blessed with faithful Abraham because everybody has the measure of faith because everybody can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse uh, uh, 9. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Go down and look at verse number 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. So if you are in Christ Jesus, you are all one. Uh, first, go to... Let me see, go to, no, stay in Galatians 3. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 4. Just listen to this verse. It says, Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. Okay? He's talking to uh, Greeks there. He's, uh, it's Thessalonica. It's a Greek city. Right. These are not Jewish people that he's talking to. And he's saying, your election of God. Countless places in the Bible, it talks about these Greek people, all sorts of different things, being the elect. Okay? Amen. But there's very clear with the contrast that Israel and the elect are two different groups. The children of the flesh and the children of the promise. You know, you say, well, uh, uh, so Jewish people, are they, can they not? No, they can believe on Christ. You, if you read Romans 9 through 11, the olive branch, whenever they're cut off, right, because of unbelief, they can be grafted back in because they was the original branch. They can be grafted back in if they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Right, if you, if I, you talk to a Jew and somebody says, hey, I'm, uh, uh, I'm Adam Sandler. 
Sandler and you say, hey, Adam Sandler, if you die today, you're 100% sure you go to heaven and you preach him the gospel and he puts all his faith, then he's saved. Amen. Hello, period. He's not saved because his last name's Sandler. He isn't saved because he wears some kind of beanie on his head. He isn't saved because he, you know, he, he's you know, rabbi with these, these dreadlocks and all of this stuff and, and I'm head banging on a wall. He's, you're saved by faith, okay, yeah. period. What about the promises? I've he I hear that, man, with the promises. Well, he promised, the promise, the promise of the land, the promise. I hear that all the time. Galatians 3, verse number 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, it says, but as of one unto thy seed, which is Christ. Stay in Galatians 3. Uh, just listen to these verses. You can write them down. If you've got a pen or something, write them down on that sermon notes. Genesis 12, verse number 7. These are the promises that he's referring to. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give to this land. Singular, seed. Who's he giving it to? The Lord Jesus Christ. Who else inherits it? Us. Why? Because we're in Christ. Okay? And the Lord said unto Abram, this is uh, Genesis 13, verse number 14. After that lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it and to thy seed. Seed, singular, forever. Okay? That is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It's not uh, uh, the physical descendants of Abraham. Verse number 16, And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. You're in Galatians 3. Look at verse number 18. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Look, look at verse number 29. And if ye be Christ, you say, well, hey, I want the promises. I want the promises. Uh, uh, the, the promises are to the, they're just to the Jews only, right? And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed. It can't get any clearer than that. I'm Abraham's seed because I am in Christ. And it says, and heirs according to the promise. That promise is mine. All of the promises that you read in Genesis, whenever God is talking to Abraham, and we're first in introduced to Abraham, and, and God promises all these things, they're mine. Those are my promises Amen. because I'm in Christ. Because they were promised to the seed. Not some physical race or physical ethnicity of people. It was promised to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I can, I'm heir to those promises because I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to Titus chapter number 3. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to reign in Jerusalem. That's his, that's his place, you know. Titus chapter number 3. You know, in the Old Testament, you had to show a genealogy to be part of the, the congregation, right? To have an inheritance. You had to show a, a genealogy. You had to show that you physically descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In the New Testament, we don't have to show a genealogy, you know? John Hagee, everybody know who John Hagee is? It says, the law of Moses, here's what he said, he is sufficient enough to bring a person to the knowledge of God until God gives him a greater revelation. He said, everyone else, whether Buddhist or Bahi, whatever that is, needs to believe in Jesus, but not Jews. That's what he said, that Jews don't have to believe on Jesus Christ, that they have an old covenant, they have a different covenant than you and I, and they don't have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Titus 1.4, it says, neither he'd give, uh, I'm sorry, 1 Timothy 1.4, you stay in Titus. 1 Timothy 1.4 says, Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith so do. Titus 3, verse number 9, you should be there. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. So if it is so important to be a Jew, right, and, and, and if I'm a Jew, then I have a different covenant with God, how do I prove that I'm a Jew, you know? I'd have to do some kind of a genealogy. Wouldn't you think that a genealogy would be profitable to me? I mean, that's, that's the way of salvation. Because if you're not a Jew, you have this one salvation, according to John Hagee and these heretics. And if you are a Jew, then you have a different covenant. So I would have to figure out what covenant, what, what am I supposed to do? How would I do that? With a genealogy. So a genealogy would be profitable, right? And the Bible says clearly here that they are unprofitable. A genealogy is unprofitable. Amen. In the New Testament, you say, well, what, do we not have to have genealogies now? Yeah, we have to show one genealogy that we're in Christ, period. Amen. If you're in Christ, you're, you're part of the congregation, you're, you're part of the nation of Israel, uh, 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 and, and you're heirs according to the promise. Go to 1 John 2. 1 John 2. But that's the only genealogy that you need in the New Testament is, are you in Christ? 
1 John 2. You know, these Jews are not Jews anyway. A lot of them are these Ashkenazi zoo, uh, Jews, and they're of, of European ancestry. A lot of them are. I mean, self-proclaimed. They're not hiding that, you know? But they don't believe the Bible. Nope. They have the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. They don't even believe that. And then they have the Talmud. The Talmud is kind of their religious book. And I've got a couple of excerpts from that. We're going to read some of it. <laughs> but Judaism is the religion of the rabbis, and everybody wants to lump them in the Bible and with Christianity, and they couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, the, uh, Judaism has nothing to do with Christianity. Right. Nothing to Amen. do with it. I mean, nothing. 1 John 2, 22, it says, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. So, just right there. I mean, we're done, okay? Why would you put any stock, any faith into anybody that the Bible just clearly said they deny? And they do. There's no hiding that. They say that Jesus Christ is not the Messiah, okay? So, who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? Why would you even listen to anything that they say? Why would you support them at all? You say, well, they believe in the God of the Old Testament. Look at verse number 23, 1 John 2, 23. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. So, do they have the Father? Nope. No. But he that acknowledges the Son hath the Father also. Go to John 5, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, John 5. You say, well, they believe in the writings of Moses. They have the Torah. They believe that. John 5, verse number 46. John 5, 46 says, For had ye believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall believe you believe my words? So, do they believe God's words? No. No. So, do they believe Moses' writings? No. He said, because if you believe those, then you would believe me. You don't believe, those, you don't believe me because you don't believe those either, you know? So let's see if the Jews that everybody loves so much, that everybody's just, oh, I mean, it's just a magic word, you know? People use, they throw that word around trying to be spiritual. Let's see if they, if, if they worship the God of the Bible. Let's see if the religion of the rabbis is something we need to support or embrace. Let me read for you a couple of things I got from, uh, I've been reading the Talmud this week, a few things out of it. This thing, it was a kind of an introduction about it. It says that the Talmud is one of the most major of all books in Judaism after the Torah. The Talmud covers every aspect of Jewish life, everything from what the Jews wear and say to how they act towards others and treat them. Okay, this is the Talmud. And one in uh, Yerubin 21b, it says, Whosoever disobeys the rabbis, it says, deserves death and will be punished by be being boiled in hot excrement in hell. That's what they say. If you disobey the rabbis. They say uh, about Jesus' mother, they said that she was a whore. They said that he is the son of, of, of her and where she committed fornication with some Roman soldiers. They also say that Jesus Christ is being boiled right now in hot excrement in hell. That he is in hell right now being boiled in hot excrement. So all of these Christians that sit there and say that the Lord Jesus Christ is their Savior and then they flag an, or fly an Israeli flag, or they, they send money to support the temple, or they're hooping and hollering when Fox News shows that Donald Trump's you know, moving the capital city to Jerusalem or whatever kind of uh, nonsense is going on, and they celebrate that, this is the filth that you're celebrating. Okay? They said that he was not the Messiah, he was an enticer. They said that he was a sorcerer, that Jesus was a sorcerer. They said it in Shabbat, I, I think if I'm pronouncing that correctly, it says that the Jews must destroy the book of the Christians, i.e. the New Testament. Judaism is a wicked religion. It is a wicked religion and it hates the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you have any inkling, any love for the Lord Jesus Christ at all, unless you're just, I mean, completely ignorant, I don't see how you can even remotely support this at all. I mean, re remotely. Let me read this for you. Uh... Oh, that's this other section here. This is from the Talmud. This is—they have all sorts of. Uh, I just want to read some of this stuff to you. In the Talmud, it has all sorts of aspects of Jewish life, right? And, and it talks about, you know, if you read in the book of Leviticus, it talks about uh, uh, some healing, and like if you see a sign of leprosy on you and things like that. And those book, those chapters, it's, I believe it's like Leviticus fourteen, fifteen, or whatever. 
may be kind of boring or whatever. I mean, not some of the best reading, you know. It's not like that. Yeah, that's not going to be your life verse, probably. You know, <laughs> probably not going to have life verses about you know the the, the oozing scab and the and the white and the, and the hair and all of those things. But having said all that. It's not just, you don't read it and you're like, well, this is just really weird, you know? It's a little gross, but I mean, you're not going to sit there and look at it like it's just absolutely bizarre. Now, let me read from the, from the Talmud on some of their home remedies, okay? Let's read some of these things. They says for a toothache, now listen to this, Rabbi B.R. Huna says that you should take the top of garlic with one stalk only and grind it with oil and salt and put it on his thumbnail on the side with the toothaches and put a rim of dough around it, taking care that it does not touch his flesh as it may cause leprosy, okay? Now, then, if you have swollen glands, okay? Swollen glands, because I mean, this stuff is just uh, unbelievable. If you have swollen glands, it goes through this process of what you should do if you have swollen glands. But if you have some kind of sore in your mouth, if you have an open sore in your mouth that you need to treat, here's what it says. To make the flesh close, he should bring dust from the shadow of a privy and knead it with honey and eat it. Okay? <laughs> Does everybody know what a privy is? Okay? A privy is a bathroom, okay? So if, if you just have, an, if you have like, like some kind of sore in your mouth and you're just driving down the street, okay, keep your little Subi honey bear, you know, in, in your car. And if you go to a construction site and you see the port john just go to the shadow of that port john get you some dirt, mix it with the honey, and that's, that's going to cure you according to the Talmud. Isn't that some of the sickest, weirdest stuff? There's nothing in the Bible that's weird like that. That is so weird. So, let me tell you this other one. It's for throat congestion, okay? It says, he can also take the excrement of a white dog, not a black one, a white one, and knead it with balsam, but if he can possibly avoid it, he should not eat the dog's excrement as it loosens the limbs. I'm this is like voodoo people, okay? <laughs> this is like, I mean, this is not, this is not practical stuff. All right, here we go. For hip disease, he says, let him take a pot of fish brine and rub it 60 times around one hip and 60 times around the other, okay? So you've got this like thing of hip, you know, so you're one, two, three, four, man, my hip pain, you know? Why, why do you still have hip pain? I only did 58 times on this hip. I did 60 on this hip, 58 times on this hip, or whatever. What kind of, I mean, this is weird. He says, for an internal fever, he should take seven handfuls of beets from seven beds and boil them with their earth and eat them and drink Audra leaves in beer. So, get you some Audra leaves and some beets that you got from seven beds, pop you open a Bud Light, and we'll, <laughs> we're going to get rid of that internal fever. I'm, I'm telling you, this is just like the craziest stuff. But, I mean, I, mean, I say all this, this is voodoo, people. I mean, this is just, this is no different than, than voodoo and these witch doctor people that like get the chicken bones and they'll throw them out and try to tell your fortunes. It's no different. It's a bunch of hocus pocus garbage. It's a bunch of, it's a bunch of strange doctrines. And, and I believe it's doctrines of devils is what it is, okay? We don't want to have anything to do with it. Deuteronomy 23, 13 says, Thou shalt have a paddle upon thy weapon, and it shall be when thou ease thyself abroad that thou shalt dig therewith and shalt turn back and cover that which cometh from thee. So it's talking about disposing of that, not eating it, okay? Not eating it, not getting it, rubbing it all over you or whatever, okay? But that's witch doctor stuff. Judaism's weird. It's wicked. It hates the Lord Jesus Christ. It says blasphemous things about Him. I don't want to have anything to do with it. Amen. It's a wicked, hellish religion. Amen. You say, well, what about those people? What about the people that are in there? Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Right. He says, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Okay? Some of these people that are, they grow up Jewish or whatever and they go to the synagogue and they do those things, they're just as lost as the Catholic, as the Pentecostal, as the Buddhist, as the Hindu. But these rabbis, these rabbis with their dreadlocks and all of that, they're out of hell. These people are out of hell. If you read and believe and love the Talmud and you hold that close to your heart and you practice that, you are out of hell. You're a wicked false prophet. I'll just go ahead and say that. Because, I mean, how blasphemous are they? Go to Matthew 24 and Daniel chapter 8. Matthew 24 and Daniel chapter number 8. We're well, jumping back and forth between those. Daniel 8 and Matthew 24. He said, well, what does Zionism have to do with the, the Antichrist? Again, here, uh, he said, what a, a little review. What have we seen so far? Number one, we've seen that we 
because we're in faith, we are blessed with faithful Abraham. We are the children of Abraham. Why? Because I, I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed, and there's according to the promise. So, number one, I am counted as Abraham's child. Secondly, I am heir to the promises because I am in Christ, because I am Abraham's child. Thirdly, we see that Judaism is a wicked religion. It has nothing to do with Christianity. It's a bunch of voodoo, uh, 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 stuff no different than you would, you would see down on... Uh, I can't even think of that main street in New Orleans where you have all the voodoo and, and, and weird stuff that goes on down there, you know? All the witch doctors and all of those things down there. It's no difference. What is it? Is it Bourbon Street? There's no, I mean, there's no difference. All of the, the weirdness and the worship of death and all these weird things that go on down there at Mardi Gras and all these spells and all of this stuff. It's no different. It's no different than witchcraft. It's no different to, you know, to do these weird things. Because I'm telling you, rubbing some old fish broth on your hips, that's dumb, okay? That's stupid, okay? Matthew 24, verse number 15. It says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. So what is it talking about, the abomination of desolation? Go to Matthew, uh, Daniel 8. Daniel 8, verse 11. It says, Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And the host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Go to Daniel 11. Daniel 11. Daniel chapter 11. It says, And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away, look at that, take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. And such as do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Verse number 33 says, And they shall understand among the people and shall instruct many. Yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil many days. Look at verse 36. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard, look at this, this is the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. Daniel 12, verse 11, let's look at that real quick. It says, From that time the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. So, you notice on this stuff when it talks about the abomination of desolation, right? So in Matthew 24, it talks about the abomination of desolation. We're going to just try to get a context here. And then you go back and you try to figure out what that is. And it keeps saying the daily sacrifice is taken away. The daily sacrifice is taken away. Well, guess what? The daily sacrifice had to be happening in order to be taken away. Right? right? And in order for those sacrifices to be conducted, where are they going to be conducted? In a temple. Right? In a temple. Whenever they build a temple. Let me read this for you. Political junkies and Middle East analysts have had to bone up on their conservative Christian theology to properly understand why Donald Trump's declaration of Jerusalem as Israel's capital was so important to the evangelicals who lobbied hard for it and have been lauding for it all week. Trump was already a hero of a wide swath of evangelicals for his efforts to fight abortion, keep transgender kids out of the wrong bathrooms, and to fill U.S. courts with die-hard conservative judges. I roll. Insert I roll. Okay? But the role he's playing in what many believe is the fulfillment of divine prophecy has gotten him promoted to king for some of them. Now listen to this. An ancient Persian king to be precise. The king who allowed the Jews to return to Jerusalem and build the second temple was Cyrus the Great. He lived until 70. Donald Trump got elected on a platform of let's make America great again. Trump took office at the age of 70. This is the kind of junk that they're promoting. This guy, this, this is like some big uh, uh, guy in the Jewish community. But this is what they're saying, is that by them trying to usher in this thing and allow the Jews their, their free state and their temple and all of this stuff, that they're comparing him to Cyrus. Donald Trump to Cyrus. Isn't that ridiculous? But having said that, Christians everywhere are like, yes, they're cheering, they're supporting that these things are happening. We'll go to Matthew uh, 24, verse number 21. We're talking about after the events that we just read, after the abomination of desolation. Matthew 24, verse number 21 says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days should be shortened. So again, 
Everybody's like, yes, man, they're going to start sacrificing again. Yes, they built the temple or whatever. Guess what? That is uh, That has to happen. Yes, of course. But do we need to support that? No, absolutely not. We don't need to support that. And guess what? That's going to happen because he's going to take away the daily sacrifice and that's going to usher in the end times. But again, like we were talking about Josiah, like we're talking about these inevitable things, these things are inevitable, but we don't need to support them. Right. We don't need yeah. to be like, oh yeah, that's fine, no problem. Let's support the Jews. We're going to take up a special love offering for the Jews, for the temple, to try to get the temple built. I don't have anything to do with Amen. that. We shouldn't have anything to do with that. Revelation 2.9, you don't have to turn there. Revelation 2.9, it says, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty. Thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them, which say they are Jews, but they are not. But they're of the synagogue of Satan. Okay? So you know what? When you're sending money over there, you're supporting the synagogue of Satan. Right. That's who you're supporting. Amen. Whenever you, you have your Israeli flag back there and your Israeli tie tack with the Israeli flag and the American flag side by side, whenever you support that, you're supporting the synagogue of Satan. Right. That's who you're supporting. You're supporting the people that talk about uh, 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 you know, rubbing dog excrement on your sores and all this weird stuff. That's what you're supporting. You're supporting a wicked religion that says the Lord Jesus Christ is, buried, is being boiled in hot excrement in hell. That is what you're supporting. Stop being ignorant and stop yeah. supporting the wicked religion of Zionism and Jews, okay? That's right. It's not about people, okay? It is a religion, okay? It is a religion that we need to be fighting against. Revelation 11, 8 says, it calls, uh, says, and their deeds and their bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Where was the Lord crucified? Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, okay? In Jerusalem. And what's it spiritually called? Sodom and Egypt. Oh, I went to the Holy Land. Oh, you went to Sodom and Egypt? Is that where you went? Huh? Did you go to Sodom and Egypt and get it led around to all the Catholic uh, 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 paraphernalia over there that they built, you know, throughout the for thousands of years? Bunch of nonsense. Go to uh, John 16. I'm closing. Go to John 16. But this support of Judaism is supporting the religion that's going to usher in the Antichrist. Okay, they're going to usher him in. The Jews are going to recognize him as the, uh, the Messiah. I mean, we read it there. It's talking about that step one. Step one is they get back to their homeland. Step, I mean, step two is, I mean, if they get that temple built and they start doing the sacrifices, God's reestablished the covenant. Can you hear it now? Can you see all the stuff? Can you see, you know, all, all of the stuff on Fox News, all the evangelical preachers, all the Joyce Myers and the John Hagees, all your Pentecostal friends and family just spout, yes, you know, they're going to be so excited about these things. And guess who's coming? Their Messiah is the Antichrist. Right. Jesus could come back at any minute in all the Baptist churches. Guess who's coming back? The Antichrist. That's a huge danger of the pre-trib rapture. Amen. Jesus can come back at any minute. Oh, wait. Oh, it's him. Oh, he's on a white horse. They said Jesus is going to be on a white horse. Hey, why didn't we get raptured? Somebody get up and they'll spin it somehow. Right. Oh, well, you did get raptured. It's just something happened, you know? Right. I mean, it'll be some kind of spin on it. It'll be some kind of spin on it. But it's dangerous. The pre-trib rapture is dangerous. Why? Because it's telling you to come. He's coming next. He's coming. You know, nothing has to happen. You know, and the first person that's going to come is the Antichrist. Okay, he's going to come. You know, and and, and we get des desensitized. Who's ever heard of the Judeo Christian? Who ever heard of that? You know, Judeo Christian or whatever. They try to lump us together. No, we're not lumped together. Okay. We're not lumped. I don't want to have anything to do with their religion. Okay? You say, what about the people? I would love. I would love. I would love for a, a, a thousand Jews to walk in here right now and say, what must I do to be saved? I would love it. I would love it. Point me to me out a Jewish community, and, and we'll go preach the gospel there. I would love it. I would love it. Uh, again, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. But I'm not having anything to do with, with Judaism. I'm not having anything to do with the, the nation of Israel. I don't care what piece of dirt these people have. That shouldn't be none of my business. That shouldn't be none of America's business, what, what they do. But again, this stuff is not about, it's not a geopolitical type thing. This stuff is of Satan, okay? It is of Satan because what Satan is trying to do, he's trying to get the, the powers that be to establish this, this nation and, and to get the temple built. Because why? Because his boy is going to be on the throne. His boy is going to take away the daily sacrifice the antichrist and he's going to rule from jerusalem he's going to sit down on the throne and say i'm god that's what he's going to do okay and your and your your dollars because you're supporting the temple and you're supporting the the, the jews and and bless israel and all this stuff you're just paying for it right. John 16, verse number 1 says, These things have I spoken to you that ye should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh, and whosoever killeth you will think he doth God to serveth. 
And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. You know, some people ignorantly support uh, uh, Israel just like these people were killing you and think they did God a service. And it said these people don't know the Father or they don't know Jesus. But to be ignorant on this topic, it's because you don't know the Word. Okay? You don't know the Word and you're ignorant. And, and maybe you're ignorantly supporting this stuff. But you need to get some smarts. You need to read the Bible and see what the Bible says. You need to open your mind and you need to read these passages and see if what you're doing is right. But I don't want to be lumped in with all the Pentecostals, all the Evangelicals, work salvation people. I don't want to need, be lumped in with any of those people. Titus 1.14 says, Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Judaism is a wicked religion. And you know what? You say, well, how are we going to fight that? We're going to preach against it. We're not going to support it. And you know what? We're going to keep preaching the gospel. We're going to try to you know, get people saved. You know? And if you knock on a door and somebody says, hey, I'm Jewish, try to preach in the gospel. You know? I have never, has anybody, I've never gotten a Jew saved. Never. Never. My brother back here has. I have never gotten a Jew saved. I mean, everyone that I've ever had experience with, which has not been tons, they've been like very, very uh, uh, adamant. Just, you know, I'm Jewish, thanks. And, you know, and they've just been very ugly. I don't want to have anything to do with it. So, but anyway, is that a knock on those people? You know, shake the dust off your feet. Go to the next door. We need to love those people. But you know what? I don't love these rabbis. You know, I don't love these rabbis. And you know what? I don't love these idiot pastors like Bill Grady. Or he's not a pastor. What is he an evangelist, whatever? I don't know what he is. He's an idiot. He's going to hell is what he's going. So how about that? Uh, uh, Bill Grady and all these people, that's a, a huge problem. Huge problem. All these independent Baptists with their Israeli flags and all this garbage going on. And there's people that are just coming out that are zealous about this, aren't they? You know, they're, it's not like that they just kind of support Israel. They're diehard Israel. We don't need to be like that. We don't need to support those people. We need to speak out and mark those people and avoid them. So let's bow our heads for prayer.